So, uh, fantastic uh, session. I hope we've confused you uh, sufficiently that we can now get into a discussion session. There are some knowns and some unknowns. Uh, we can summarize the knowns and then we can discuss the unknowns and decide on how to move forward to address those unknowns. Just because NGS and molecular technique presents some challenges in terms of understanding things. Um, let me bring this maybe thank you this for this forward a little bit. It doesn't really mean we have to run away from them. I think we just need to invest some more time and um, understand some of the issues. So I will be giving a talk in a few minutes about the issues with NGS and we'll get into some more details. But I have Dr. Joe John, who's an uh, uh, ID specialist here, and I would like him to answer the first question that's come up by multiple people. And that is, does NGS or PCR pick up viable organism? And Nick, you may want to weigh in as well. Or could this be just the, the DNA that we, it, it's the footprint of the organism, but the organism is not. Well, thanks very much, Jay. Uh, Dead DNA doesn't last very long in human tissue. There are endo and exonucleases uh, that destroy it fairly quickly. So in general, probably the current party line is that the presence of DNA reflects some weeping, some fragmentation of replicating microorganisms. One can always take an off the stand from that and say the DNA gets in ensconced encased or otherwise protected in sanctuary. Uh, but I think of all the studies that you've seen this morning, you see a consistency of retrieving DNA. The one last point would be that NGS can be used as a corroborative. Uh, as Dr. Schmidt was saying, a sim kind of a simultaneous uh, culture and NGS determination. The individual practitioner can even compare her or his own data with how often NGS will corroborate uh, the culture presence, meaning the repl repl replicative ability, the growing ability of that organism. So I think in general, that is uh, it's evolving as a minor consideration um, and future studies may be able to, delene to delineate that better with just how recent that DNA was fragmented from its original uh, bacterial or fungal host. So one thing we have come to realize in the last few years is that just about every site in the body has a signature of organisms that exist there and so-called the microbiome. Right? The science of microbiome was mostly related to GI tract, but in recent years we've seen distinct microbiome shoulder joint that was presented earlier. We have a, a study that will be published soon that shows the microbiome in the hip and the knee, the CSF, even urine, even uh, sites like, like the brain where everybody thought it's a sterile site. That's not true anymore. There is a microbiome. So the challenge that we have to face uh, in trying to understand the data from NGS is when do we treat the organisms in other words, when are these organisms pathogens and when are they the commensals or so-called the microbiome? Any suggestions from you or Mike uh, in terms of how to interpret that data right now? Uh, I think, I think uh, in discussion with Dr. Schmidt, uh, I'll let him elaborate a bit that crosstalk may be the ultimate uh, uh, su suggestion and the ultimate determination of whether a commensal becomes a pathogen, what gets turned on in terms of factors within that bacteria that may not be expressed or may be expressed under crosstalk. And I'll let uh, Dr. Smith make a comment too. It, it really is about the crosstalk. Remember, bacteria talk amongst themselves as well as they talk to our cells. And some of the things that we're seeing develop in the literature is how the signaling that comes from microbes is actually influencing behaviors in the host. And this is the great conundrum that faces the treating clinician in the sense that when you add the antimicrobial, you're perturbing the community that in turn perturbs the signaling that is normally going on 
and whether or not the abnormal signals that have that are now being generated because the other microbes may be refractory to the antimicrobials you're providing may create a different clinical environment than the host is normally used to. So again, I, I hate to answer with, we need more data, but that's effectively what is being discovered by the studies that Dr. Pravisi is doing, that your uh, multi-center trials have done that we're seeing in the development of the urine trials. Many of these studies are saying it, it's much more complicated and it's truly a microbial ecology problem as well as a medicine problem. And this perspective, perspective study that, that Dr. Kraswami just showed so elegantly, uh, uh, which is off and running, already giving us some initial uh, inference that the uh, that this, the standing microbiome within these, in this case, joints, uh, uh, are going to be predictive of, uh, of ultimate pathogenicity and how that, that group of organisms either becomes stifled by uh, preoperative antibiotics, antibiotic feeds, other host factors, or whether the bacterial community gains the upper hand uh, through a quorum, what's called quorum sensing of each other's uh, genome uh, is what we have to figure out. And I think Jay's earlier comment about non-antibiotic treatment for these pathways uh, and COVID, they always bring in COVID. COVID is a harbinger of this in that uh, the, monoclonal, uh, the mon monoclonal antibody therapy of COVID has been so successful in just blocking ascending sites, not just killing virus, so that we're getting a tremendous instruction now as we go through this decade. And at the end of this decade, I think we're going to see a marked change in therapy. Uh, it may be too, become too complicated for us all a prosthetic joint infection. Yeah, these are great points. And I think the uh, monoclonal antibody treatment for a lot of hypercholesteremic patients, a lot of other conditions are emerging. Amazing clinical trials. If you go to clinicaltrial.gov, there is a huge number of these monoclonal antibodies. Thanks to the anti-sense technology, Nobel winning prize, uh, that has really changed the uh, scene. Believe me, I, it may not be in my lifetime, but it, very soon we are going to be moving away from this knee-jerk reflex of doing a culture, six weeks of intravenous antibiotics, and then seeing 20, 30% of these patients fail. That's failure as a result of reinfection. If you take their functional outcome, their return back to work, their satisfaction with their new joint, the results are disastrous. And 21st century, this is just unacceptable. We've got to be moving in the right direction. And the question is, how do we move there? And on that note, a couple of very fascinating questions that have come up. I'll answer one of them, and then I'd like you all to weigh in. Nick Shami, who's a spine surgeon, asks, is there a difference between the microbiome of individuals? And is there a difference in the microbiome uh, from time to time? Stefan Kruzier asks, could you survey the uninfected joint, find out what the signal of microbiome is in that particular uninfected joint, uh, subtract that from the signal that you get from the infected joint to find out what is infected, what is not. Fascinating idea, right? So one thing I will tell you about microbiome that we're reading a lot about and learning about, a microbiome of one individual to another is absolutely different. It's almost a DNA signature. It's like your fingerprints. And, and amazingly, the microbiome of your joint, your gut, actually changes throughout the day. In fact, this morning, depending on what you ate, your microbiome might be different than tomorrow. The, set, the third issue is that the microbiome is genetically determined, but of course, influenced by the environment, just like any other diseases we know about. And then another point that uh, Joe mentioned to me this morning, which is very important for us to to continue to talk about, microbiome doesn't mean non-pathogen. Any of those organisms in your microbiome who turn into a professional pathogen, as Bill Gossett used to say, overnight. In fact, Staph aureus is part of your microbiome in a lot of sites in your body. So the question that arises, and I want Nick to maybe weigh in, 
is could we use AI or sophisticated software or something and uh, along the line of what Stefan was just suggesting to be able to understand the signal that we get on the NGS. And by the way, these are not false positive. I keep hearing people say false positive. This is not false positive. The DNA is there. But whether this is acting as a pathogen or not, how would, how can we move forward to try to address that issue? Yeah, it's interesting. Do you all hear Nick? Because he's a long way from the microphone. I think yeah. it's interesting with the right markers to so look at yeah, the right instance. You can certainly see where a particular community might be going, um, especially looking at it over a longitudinal uh, time course. Um, I think something, something else that I brought up in the chat earlier, like there's a study that talks about. Like they're having difficulty hearing you. So either key. Come switch with me, Nick. Yeah. Yeah. Speak to the owl. Over. You have to speak to the Sorry. Owl. Because what you're saying is actually very important for people to hear. So what I was saying is that AI, I think there is some promise there. If we've got the right data points to look at, um, we can certainly determine how a community is going to progress longitudinally over treatment. Um, something that I brought up earlier in the chat to a point that Dr. Schmidt made earlier about um, determining the difference between a pathogen versus some background microbiota. There is a study that looked at using thresholds for NGS. This is common. I mean, this is practice in uh, for biomarkers and things like that. So if uh, uh, in this particular study I referenced, they had 70 patients and they determined thresholds of 15% relative abundance for bacteria, 30% for fungi, increased specificity, I think, to 95.9%, which was significantly higher than the comprehensive culture. Um, while that those thresholds worked for them in that study, I think further investigation as to what thresholds might be applied in a standard practice, a standard care practice, um, is needed um, to be able to determine that. So this is a great point. I don't know if you all understand what uh, Nick means by threshold. So, you know, a lot of people ask, well, why don't I just buy my own NGS machine and start to sequence. Well, you can, but understanding that data has required millions and millions of data points. And uh, Microgen and Nick is one of the PhDs that works on Microgen DX, and we are continuously on the phone to him to decide on some of these signals that come through. And by the way, he's always available, and you're welcome to reach out to him whenever you have difficulty understanding your NGS signal. So what he means by threshold is, if I pick up one DNA versus 10 DNA versus a million DNA, what is that actually relevant? So every type of bioinformatics determines a threshold, usually 3%, 5% relative abundance of DNA. Below that signal, you call it negative. Above that signal, then you give the information to the clinicians. A part of the reason why we're going to talk about this in a few minutes, part of the reason why in the multi-center study, we received signal in a large number of these people is because we dropped the threshold to zero. Basically, we wanted to see anything that everything that comes up in those samples that we sent to Microgen DX. Now, that threshold is important. That's one. Then the second is the number of cycles you run and how much extra analysis you do on these samples. Right. Because there has been one or two occasions when we've sent a sample to you and you've sent us a report back saying no organisms detected. And then I will call you up and say, well, believe me, this one is definitely an infected machine. You run another one and then you would increase the number of cycles or whatever you have to do or drop the threshold and then you give us the, uh, the organism that exists in there. So that's the sophisticated bioinformatics software that we, we are, we're not going to be able to uh, address here today. That's really for scientists like yourself to, uh, to address. But the question that still comes up and that's what I would really like to cover in the next talk, is when you detect multiple organisms in an infected case, and John, I would like you to sort of weigh in on the, here as well, does that mean we have to treat them all? Or is it like one of them that's a pathogen and the rest are not? I am not an MD, but I think you need to treat them all. Because one thing we see in this polymicro 
is when you are able to provide coverage for only one or, the, one or two of the most dominant species in the sample, what you see on the next sampling event is a rise in things that were lower dominance or maybe even not there because they were, their prevalence was so low in the sample. Right, or they were VPNC. So Mike, I mean, let's have John answer this question and then you also need to weigh in here. So is it possible? I don't know what percentage of cultures are polymicrobial, John. Maybe you could uh, point to that. And then secondly is definitely NGS is much more likely to be polymicrobial than culture. How do we interpret that result? And then perhaps the two of you could talk about, are these VPNCs? Yeah, now I don't know the answer for next generation. Can you all hear so, Dr. Segretti? But as far as cultures are concerned, I would say probably about 15% of the cultures are uh, polymicrobial. And I think you uh, make a clinical decision based on the organism and how many of the cultures are positive. So if five out of the five cultures are positive for staph aureus, and one of them has a plague negative staph, but only one out of the five is plague negative staph, I'll ignore the plague negative staph. But if you've got five out of five staph aureus, three out of five plague negative staph, I'll treat both of them. Right. So I think it depends on the context that you're talking about and the individual patient. If the surgeon tells me this is definitely infected and only one out of five cultures grow something, I'll treat that one organism. So again, you can't be hard and fast in terms of numbers and you have to individualize care for each individual patient. Yeah. Mike, what are your thoughts? What Dr. Segretti is bringing up is we need additional information. We need other biomarkers to appreciate whether or not the signal is actually indicative of an infectious process. And the orthopedic world is interesting in the sense that they open the joint and they can tell immediately whether or not that joint is inflamed. They, they can tell. They, they, they can look at it, they, they know what's actually going on. And that's the piece of data that Dr. Scretti gets from the surgeon calling him up and said, Dr. Scretti, I, I know this patient's infected. And then that informs the decision tree about what's actually going on. But I go back to a statement made by Arturo Casadevall, who said, it, it's really about the microbes that are present because this whole issue of commensal versus pathogen is an obsolete concept because we now know that the microbes are all talking with us and against us. And it's up to the infectious disease ortho team to develop the right treatment scheme to solve that problem. And that's what we're trying to do, solve a problem in understanding what's actually going on. And Nick's informed us. And the trick with AI is it depends on the data set. And so that's why it's so important that you guys have done a multi-center trial where you brought the threshold as low as you could go in which you could still believe the sequence was real. And you can then put that into an unbiased artificial neural network that then can make the decision as to what microbes are relevant. And that will come with time in larger studies. And so, I, I just want to pick up on that with Mike uh, and John in saying that when the choice of antibiotics ultimately comes down to what the infectious disease team may decide along with uh, uh, the, the entire team, has so much to do with this relative balance of organisms. For instance, in, in Dr. Segretti's example, if there are five staph aureuses that are continuing to grow out in, in uh, five uh, samples, and let's say one or two of those are coag negatives, we may, we may uh, ignore them. Let's say three are coagulase negative staphylococci. Let's say we throw another gram negative uh, in there that happens to be a very good biofilm former. Then we're, then we're left with what really it comes down to after the intravenous therapy, a much harder decision about what to keep these patients on. Jay is right around 52,000 infections or uh, uh, a year. Uh, and you extrapolate to 
how many people currently are on suppression, so-called suppression, for their uh, prosthetic joint infection? And it may not be suppression. We still may be treating them. What percentage of those are on doxycycline? You know, probably 70%. And then the decision of whether to add right Now, for us, in the IV field of adding rifampin, what always comes up is liver toxicity and how we then have to, to regulate that. I only wax one more time to say that most of these infections outside of NGS are going to be treated with bank and piptasa. Most of them, not all. But let's say that's kind of the standard therapy. But we got to go back to what Mike was referring to in our AI analysis. If we now then take this very low threshold group of organisms, how often can we predict that piptasa or bank will work? Bank is becoming an outdated antimicrobial. Although I don't know how Dr. Segretti feels, we're updating it very slowly. Uh, and then one other comment about the microbiome itself is that there certainly are protective uh, species within our microbiome, particularly in gut. So one of my jokes around the microbiome bio community is that we all of us want a little bit of Prevotella and we all want a little bit of Clostridium. I'm speaking to orthopedists, that, you know, that may be Latin, which in fact it is, or Greek, but in fact, even within your microbiome community, within your, within your normal joint, there may be protectors in there. So this gets very hairy. And I think the, the big question for me in practicing infectious diseases is when you get to the end of that infusion, patient's almost always getting a little better. Then the hard decision comes, what's left? Do we ask the orthopedist to the, the captain at the end of that sequence, is there any fluid left? Are you still suspicious the joint is still infected? And you have to prolong uh, parenteral antibiotics or, or go to some of these newer oral antibiotics. And the antibiotic scene is changing. That's for another symposium. Yeah. So one, uh, I mean, I mean we've, actually, we've got, this is great discussion and we're gonna talk more, but one thing I, uh, that's going around is this polymicrobial. I wanna remind you of the data that Karan just presented. First of all, the fact that culture negative still is right. And I know many of you are going to say you haven't seen culture negatives. Well, I'm going to argue that you're not using the right diagnostic criteria. Because if you use the right diagnostic criteria, you're going to see 20, 30% culture negative. At Jefferson, it's 29.5%. I know Dr. Bell, one of our ID doctors is on this call. Um, you know, 30% of the time, we're calling here and saying, how are you going to treat this patient? Psychologically, 21st century, you're sitting in front of a patient, you're telling them your joint is infected. I'm going to take you through two operations. I'm going to put a pick line. I'm going to give you antimicrobials. And by the way, you have about 20% chance of failure. And you can't tell that patient what they're infected with. If the patient turns around to you and says, what antibiotic are you going to give me? And you give them a list of them. They're going to say, how did you decide on these antibiotics when you don't actually have the organs? This is just unacceptable in the 21st century. Number two, and by the way, that's not just joints. Spine, you have the same problem. Trauma, you have the same problem. Tumor, you have the same problem. We honestly, we need to be a little honest with the data and need to understand we have an issue with the culture moving forward. You know, I used to do this 20 years ago. And I would give a talk in meetings and I would come off the podium and everybody would say, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never seen an infection. None of my joints ever get infected. And now, of course, we are honest with it. And infection is one of the most major issues we're dealing with. The second thing that you have to remember is that what Koran showed in this observational study, when we looked at the NGS signal versus culture, and we looked back to see what NGS picked up in reception arthroplasty and what culture did, we noticed two things. One is that NGS usually picked up more organisms than culture did. Maybe they are VBNCs. And the second and most important part is that those organisms came back onto us and caused a later failure. So they were there. The other point that you brought up, Karan, is very important. There's 10 times higher likelihood of failure in so-called ICM negative, MSIS negative revisions that have an NGS signal versus those that don't. I know Tom Bowers on this uh, on this call 
Tom and I wrote a paper on diagnosis of PJI. The last concluding sentences that we had in there, in that paper, which is almost 15 years old now, it says, maybe some of these so-called aseptic cases are in fact infections that don't meet our diagnostic criteria, or even worse, they were not investigated for infection, and the doctors who were treating this patient failed to identify an infection. So just keep these in the back of your mind as we move forward. I don't have the answer to all the questions or the issues. In fact, I also have a lot of questions. But having those questions is important for us because the current state of affairs is not perfect. Far from it. And we've got to move in the right direction and make changes. With that editorial, I'll come off my white horse and I'll go over there and uh, sit down.